you for your worship, man. I, it just it does my heart so good to look out across the congregation and see hands lifted and tears flowing and see God blessing and moving. It's times movements like that of His Spirit that will carry you through. They'll carry you through those dark times. They'll carry you through the the trials and the struggles that God knows we all face. But man, I thank you for your worship. Thank you for honoring His presence today. Thank you for being here with us today and we're going to continue a series that the Lord gave to me sometime last year as I was preparing and praying about what uh, he was going to to do for us the beginning of 2016 and the Lord laid a, a series on my heart God's at war and we're talking about the false gods lowercase g of this world that are at war for the throne of your heart how many of you know we don't wrestle against flesh and blood We're not fighting against each other. We're wrestling against spirits and principalities and rulers of high places. There are gods in this world that are at war for the throne of your heart, and they creep in so carefully, almost undetectable, almost unrecognizable, and they begin to set up their domain on the throne of our hearts, and we don't even realize it until we look back and we say, man, I, I'm maybe perhaps not where I used to be with God. My relationship with him has grown cold. And, and there's a lot of other things that are occupying my time and becoming the priorities of my life. I mean, you know, God said, seek ye first. First, the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Then all these things, everything else in life that you need, he said, will be added unto you. Today we're talking about a battle and it's the battle for your heart. Can I tell you, the heart is what they're after. It's your heart because the heart is the center. It's the core. It's the, the hub of who you are. I think the Hebrew uh, word talking about the heart is literally like means the kernel of the nut. It is the center of uh, everything that we are our whole lives. The heart. And that is what these gods are after. So let's look at a verse of Scripture and see what the Bible tells us about the heart. Proverbs chapter 4, verse number 23, one verse of Scripture, and this is what it says. Above all else. Somebody say above all else. Above all else. Guard your heart. Why? Because it says everything not, not some things, not most. Everything you do flows from the heart. How, how many of you ever watched the great, this is fixing to get really spiritual, the great crocodile hunter? <laughs> how, many, how many watched old Steve Irwin? Yeah, Steve Irwin. He was probably one of, of our lifetimes anyway, greatest conservationist. He was a great television personality, a great wildlife expert, and uh, he, he grew up, I mean, from just a small child around some of the most exotic and the most dangerous animals on the planet. For his sixth birthday, do you know what he was given? Six years old. His gift from his parents was a 12-foot Burmese python. Sixth birthday. By the age of nine, think about our children, nine years old, he had already wrestled his first crocodile. The age of nine years old. And by his teenage years, he was working with his parents who owned and operated a a wildlife park in Australia and had already captured, now as a teenager, he had captured and relocated over 100 crocodiles. By a teenager. When he, by, by the time he was 29 years old, he actually took over the wildlife park and renamed it to the Australia Zoo, I believe it was. became very popular. He started filming uh, television programs, and we all love to, to watch Steve. Up until his untimely death in September of 2006. And what was so shocking to us about his death, not only was he so young, it was the way in which he died. He was filming a, a program, September the 6th, 2000, or September the 4th, I believe, 2006, filming a program called Ocean's Deadliest, swimming with stingrays, something he had done many of, of a time before. But this particular day, he's swimming, snorkeling in about six feet of water with uh, one of the largest species of stingray, the Australian bull ray. 
The Australian bull ray, those uh, little friends right there can get up to four feet wide, eight feet long, and they will weigh in at over 200 pounds. Now, stingrays, what what are they known for? They have a a barb. They have this spike uh, in the end of their tail that has a a venom that they will use to fend off predators. Now, most folks will tell you that stingrays are are, uh, pretty docile, that, you know, they're they're not really known to attack people. The only time they would perhaps uh, stick that barb in in your foot or your ankle uh, would be because maybe you've stepped on one because they usually kind of hang out in the sand, any attacks that's ever happened in the past have, have always usually been non-fatal because they only happen to the lower extremity, perhaps your leg or your ankle or your foot. And it's nothing really serious. As a matter of fact, as I was looking this up and researching, it said the only way that a stingray could actually kill a person for it to be fatal is for that barb to enter the chest cavity or the abdomen area simply because the venom would be so close to your major organs. But on this fateful Monday morning, Steve Irwin did not just get a puncture with a barb to his abdomen. He did not just receive a a puncture from a barb from this stingray to his chest cavity. The barb from that stingray went right into the most susceptible and at-risk part of the human body. It went into his heart. Today, uh, folks that are in the medical field, most health conscious, most health uh, uh, education is focused on one particular subject, keeping the heart healthy, taking care of your heart. Why? Because we know everything to do with our body, everything that makes us live flows from the heart. My good friend, uh, Terry Ratcliffe, Bubba we call him, he, uh, my age in his mid-30s or so, ended up last week at Montgomery County Hospital, had a heart attack. Two major blockages. One was 99.9% blocked in an artery that the doctor called the widow maker because he said when that artery gets blocked, man, it's the main blood flow supply to the heart. When the heart stops working, you know what happens? We die. The heart, it is so important, and then so it is with God. What is true physically, naturally, is also true spiritually. Can I tell you something, folks? God always begins with the heart and works his way outward. Now, we, we kind of have a little different look on this. Sometimes we tend to focus on what's on the outside and maybe neglect what's on, but not with God. What does 1 Samuel 16, verse number 7 tell us? People look at the outward appearance but God looks at the heart see your heart it is the the main connector between you and God the heart Romans uh, chapter 10 verses 9 and 10 I just quoted this at to Katana's funeral yesterday it's with the heart mankind is restored back into right relationship with God listen to this verse if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead you will be saved for with the heart one believes unto righteousness and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation The heart, it is the instrument through which true sanctification takes place. What what did David pray in Psalms 51 and 10? Create in me a pure heart, pure, a clean heart, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse number 15 says to sanctify, set apart the Lord God in your heart. And then Jesus telling the folks who ask him, what is the greatest commandment of all? He said, to love the Lord your God with all of your heart, your mind and your soul. What if I told you today you have a heart condition? What if I was to tell you that today? Man, Brother Larry Hallman just a couple of weeks ago ended up in the hospital and he went to give blood and his his, uh, blood Blood pressure or his, or his heart beating was, was way down. His pulse was really small compared to what it should be. The numbers were low. Went to the emergency room, ended up in the hospital, and they told him your heart is not beating or functioning half of it anyway correctly. You have a heart condition. And he said, Brother Larry, there's something we can do for you. Do you want us to do it? And what did you say, Larry? Yes. <laughs> Fix it. You know, 
Whatever the problem, if I told you you've got a heart condition today, what would you do? You would want to go get it corrected. Well, here's the truth. We were born with a heart problem. Jeremiah says this, the heart, man's heart is deceitful above all things. And it is desperately wicked. Our hearts, man, they are in, innately sinful. And nothing short of a heart transplant is going to be able to save us. But I've got some good news. The God we serve also specializes, in case you didn't know, as a cardiothoracic surgeon. And for the lay people, I looked that up by the way, but for the lay people that don't know what that means, it means he's a heart surgeon. He focuses on the heart. Let me tell you what Ezekiel chapter 36, number 20, verse number 26 says, I will give you a new heart, praise God, and I will put a new spirit within you. He said, listen, I will remove, somebody say remove, I will take out from you that old heart of stone and I will give you a brand new heart, a heart of flesh, praise God. Is anybody glad that God specializes in the heart transplant kind of business that he can still take that old heart, that sin sick heart and somehow take it and regenerate it and revive it and renew it and dip it in his precious blood and what was black get stuck in red blood and somehow it comes out white as snow, being regenerated, transformed by the power of Jesus Christ. According to Gill's Expository Bible, this is what it says of your new heart. It says it's a heart that has been renewed by the Spirit and the grace of God. It is a new heart in which a new principle of life is put. A heart in which new light is infused, which a new will is placed, in which a new desires are formed. It is the putting on of the new man as we are fashioned into a brand new creation and into the very image of Christ. Can I tell you that is the greatest supernatural heart transplant I have ever heard of in my life. A transplant. Did you know that natural heart transplants have only been successful since about the year 1967? And even today in 2016 a heart transplant still only has about a 50% survival rate over an extended, a long period of time. Now, I don't know about you, but man, that doesn't seem like really good odds. But man, I got to thinking, you know what? God has a great, greater success story than even physical heart transplants. Because I can think about it in my mind, there are more than 2 billion people across the planet who had that sin-sick heart removed from them, that heart of stone taken out from them and got washed in the precious blood of Jesus and they can sing the song, what can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What does Isaiah say? Come now. Let us reason together. One, one uh, translation says, let us settle the matter once and for all. Says the Lord, though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white like snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall be white like wool. Is anybody glad that the life-giving flow of the blood of Jesus can still wash away the effects of sin in your life? And God can supernaturally still remove that old heart and give you a brand new heart. But here's the thing, the regeneration of our heart depends a lot upon what we allow into it. And, and we know that the first avenue, the highway to your heart is through your head. 
That's why we have to control, we have to monitor the thoughts that we think, Sister Bernard, the, the things we allow to occupy our minds. That's why Philippians said, think on these things, things that are pure and holy and just. Don't allow just everything to enter your mind because here's what happens. Those thoughts that enter your mind, they eventually will make their way into your heart and then before you know it, they'll come spilling out of your because it's from the abundance of the heart that the mouth begins to speak. What God the God that is winning the war for your heart has a lot to do with how diligently you are guarding and protecting it. I want you to listen to a, a, a beautiful song that I found by Brian Free and Assurance called Guard Your Heart. I know that's true. We have to be intentional about guarding, protecting our heart. Let's look at that, that scripture one more time. I'm going to give you three things quickly this morning. The opening text said, above all else, uh, above everything, guard your heart. In other words, it means make this your greatest priority. The, the King James said, with all diligence. You know, we, we protect our homes with security alarms. I got deadbolt locks. We got security lights. Most of us keep weapons within pretty close proximity to us at all times so that we can protect our families or our homes or our possessions if the, if the case should so arise. But the question is, how much are we truly protecting and guarding our heart? When the Bible said, above all else, first and foremost. Why? Because it is your greatest Asset greater than even your family or your home or your possessions above all else. The psalmist prayed this, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord my God and my Redeemer. Our tendency as people is to give a little more attention to what the outside looks like. You know, as long as I can put on my Sunday best and go to church and smile and look all good, you know, don't nobody know what's going on inside. But can I tell you, God knows what the condition of your heart is. And God's not worried about what you look like as much as he is what's going on with your heart. Above all else, he said, guard your heart. Above everything else. But 20th century psychology has got us focused on symptom-based care. Quick fix methodology. You know, like if you got a, if you got a gambling problem, then just don't go to the casino. Don't play the billion-dollar Powerball. <laughs> Moving right along. If you've got, a, uh, <laughs> if you've got a, a drinking problem, just don't go to the, the bar. You know, if you've got a drug problem, stay away from the drugs. you got an anger problem, count to ten. I mean, you know, and all of those things are, are, are good, positive actions. But can I tell you what you're really doing? We're picking up downstream trash that's flowing from an upstream landfill. Because the problem is the heart. Above all else, he said. The real issue is that there's a God at war for the throne of your heart. What was the next? Above all else, guard your heart. You guard your heart. Why? Because it is extremely valuable. We don't guard worthless things, right? My trash. Y'all laughing. My trash I drag from my home down my driveway. It's about 300 feet or so. I'm a good little distance away. Down to the end of my driveway, and it sits out there all night long on Wednesday night after church, Lenny. I don't stand there and watch after my trash. You know why? Because it's junk. It's worthless. Now, I did find out shortly after moving to our new home that uh, my $75 trash can that houses my worthless junk is pretty valuable, apparently. You leave that thing sitting out all night long and somebody will steal it. But that's for another message. Caught stealing the preacher's trash can will send you to hell. And that's a true story. Somebody stole my trash can. A $75 trash can from Lowe's, might I add. 
To guard, what does it mean? It means to protect. It means to defend. It wasn't none of y'all, was it? Y'all laughing awful hard up in here. <laughs> to protect, it means to defend. It means to shield. To guard implies that there's an enemy that must be withheld. You know, when we guard something, we aren't lackadaisical. We're proactive about it. We aren't asleep at the wheel, Helen. We are sober and alert-minded because we know there is a devil on the prowl who is looking for somebody to devour. We guard. We set up a, a defense against him. Philippians tells us the peace of God, even his peace will serve as a shield for your heart. The peace of God which surpasses all understanding will Guard, it says, your heart and mind in Christ Jesus, our Lord. When, when I think about guarding, I, I have to give you these things. When I think about guarding, I can't help but think about my wife. She loves when I do that. Steve Irwin in 2006 was impaled with a barb, you know, from those stingrays and the following year, 2007, we took a cruise. And one of the places we went to was the, was, look at her eyes. She's like, I rebuke you in the name of Jesus. She, we took a cruise to the Grand Cayman Islands. Now, one of the, the, the coolest things about the Grand Cayman Islands, it's the only place in the world where you can swim with wild stingrays. And they, they've made it a tourist attraction. And the, these things are actually in the ocean. They are wild. They've not been debarbed or whatever you call it. I mean, they're, they're just like Jesus made them, okay? So we, they, they do a tour. The, these folks used to apparently would fish. These fishermen would go out and, and they would uh, uh, fish all day. They'd come back in the afternoon and they would dump whatever leftover bait they had. This is how this got started, in, into the ocean. These stingrays apparently were kind of smart, realized what was happening. They would come and eat this, this bait. Well, after so long, these things began to realize these people, these men, fishermen, are coming at the same time every day. So as the fishermen pulled up, the stingrays were waiting on them. True story. And they would dump the, the bait out, and they would eat it and go about their business. Well, finally, these fishermen got the idea, we're going to get out of the boat and see if we can't feed these things. Sure enough, they got out, had the food the stingray ate right out of their hands. They became almost semi-tame, if you will, but yet in the wild. So what they do, hey, let's get some American to give us $500. We'll take him out there to swim with them. <laughs> and that's what they did. Mike, man, they, and I got the idea. I was like, I want to do that. So I talked my loving wife into accompanying me out in the middle of these stingray. And I, I don't know how she made this correlation. Of course, first thing, she gets out of the boat, and she's like, she was, you know, I mean, this is a year after Steve Irwin's been killed, and, you know, she's kind of already a little uh, scared. of. Yeah, she's guarding her heart, Kathy. That's right. And we get out of the boat, and, and I don't know how she connected this, but she's afraid of dogs. And she told me later the only thing she could picture was a, a, just a, a swarm of dogs surrounding her, like a pack of dogs all around her. Because literally there's probably hundreds when you get in the water of these things swimming all around you. She flipped plumb out. She was like a cat up on a up on like a like a post. She got up on the leader's head. Like she had to piggy the man had to piggyback my wife back to the boat. She was so scared of these guarding your heart. When I think of guarding, you know what I think of? I think of Fort Knox. Fort Knox, it is home to much of the nation's gold reserve, housed in a two-story building constructed of 16,500 cubic feet of granite. Over 1,400 tons of steel and 4,200 cubic yards of concrete. The vault door, just the door, weighs over 20 ton. And no one person has the entire combination to get into that vault. Guarding. You know, you know what I think of? I think of the tomb of the unknown soldier. And I've had the privilege of standing there in Washington, D.C. and watch the changing of, of the guard. These folks that have been guarding this tomb every minute of every day. Think about that. 
through every kind of inclement weather without end since 1937. The soldiers who guard this tomb, they work 24-hour shifts. They spend eight hours prior to their shift preparing their uniform for the next day. And they have to pass a series of tests, mental and physical, just to even be considered for the position. Now, when you think of all those things and you take into light, you put that in the context that the Scripture said, above all else, greater than even Fort Knox and all the security that it has, even greater than the tomb of the unknown soldier who men and women in uniform do not cease to guard and protect somebody that they don't even know. Even more than those things, the Bible said, guard Defend, protect your heart from the gods of this world that are at war to sit on the throne of it. Because you know what is inside, Sister Verna, is just that valuable. I'm closing with this. They can come back to the instruments. The last thing said, what? Above all else, guard your heart. Why? Because everything... Somebody say everything. Everything flows from the heart. You know, your your natural heart, I read it, it beats 100,000 times. And it pumps 2,000 gallons of blood every day. Everything flows. Your whole life you exist because your heart functions properly. That's why the heart, it it must be guarded. The heart, it must be protected naturally. But I'm talking to us spiritually today. Guarding, protecting our heart. Why? Your heart, it's the battleground. Your, Your heart, it's the front line where these gods of war are trying desperately to claw, scratch their way onto the throne of your heart because they know everything to do with your life. It's the center. It's the core of who you are. Your heart, it spills into your thoughts. It spills into your actions. It spills into your words. Proverbs went on to say, where where does the heart overflow? It overflows into our thoughts. It overflows into what our mouth speaks. It overflows into where our eyes gaze and even where our feet trod. A natural stream, if it gets contaminated upstream we know that everything downstream right gets affected so it is with the heart if they can get your heart they've got it all because everything everything who you are what you do everything flows from the heart at the heart of the issue it's always an issue with the heart Elizabeth Proverbs 27, 19 said these words, As water reflects your face, as you can look in water and see yourself, so the heart reflects one's life. The heart is a reflection of who you are. Everything about you, what you do, what you stand for. Jesus reprimanded the religious crowd because he said, you do this, you honor me with your lips. You got a lot of, you got a lot of good things to say. The outside looks all right. But he said, I'm not worried. It's the heart. The heart is far from me. If there's ever been a time when we could really see that, I guess, played out in real life by a man who carried a a Bible, tattered Bible. He, he, He used good Christian vocabulary. He claimed in front of thrones of people he claimed he said I I draw my strength I draw my ambition from this book from the pages of this book he was accepted by people all around the world as a man sent from God but history has proven that Adolf Hitler was anything but a man sent from God he was a man that had outward religiosity with no inward reality and that's what I want to ask you today 
Man, the outside might look right. We might come to church. We might even lay at the altar and pray. But if we go home and we keep doing the same things we've always done, if we keep on visiting the same places, we keep talking the same way we're talking before, let me tell you, there's a God that is winning the war for the throne of your heart. And it is not God Jehovah. There's a God of this world that is sitting on the throne of your heart. And I'm not trying to be mean today. I'm not trying to be mean-spirited. But I believe the time is coming when the games have got to end. I believe the time is coming when the Lord is going to begin to separate the wheat and the tear. And you're going to make a choice. One way or the other. There's only two. This ain't Burger King. It's his way or no way. Your heart. I'm concerned about your heart today. My heart. I believe I believe even good Christian people who love God, if we're not careful, things of the world, man, we're in it, but we're not of it. They'll start to climb and scratch their way onto the throne of our heart. And we might come to church and lift our hands and worship Him and bless Him and and really love Him. But all the while, we've got a problem going on inside of our heart. That He's not first above everything else. We need to make sure that our hearts are right before God. We need to make sure that we are intentional about guarding, protecting it from the things we see, from the thoughts we think, allowing uh, the conversations to go on around us that don't need to be going on around us. It's all right sometimes to say, you know what? I'm a Christian. I don't appreciate that. And if it continues, I'll find a new place to go. It's all right to say that sometimes. You don't have to be a part of the conversations and, and the talk and the joke telling that goes on. We don't have to be a part of those things. We're a separate people. We are sanctified. We've been set apart by God. We're not of this world. All I know is I'm not home yet. This is not where I belong. I feel like Abraham. I'm a foreigner just passing through. But I got my sight set on a city which has foundations whose builder and maker is God. Would you stand to your feet today? Man, I I want the Lord to speak to you. I'm I'm up here too. I'm I'm talking to God for myself. Lord, search my heart, God. Search my heart, Lord. In in my best effort to try to serve you and serve this church and serve God's people, it, it is still possible that even I, as a pastor, could allow, if I weren't careful, but for the grace of God, go I. I'm not careful and diligent about guarding, protecting, preserving my heart. Would you, would you bow your heads and your hearts for just a moment? Just close your eyes. And I, I just want to listen. It's between you and the Lord. It's really between you and the Lord. It makes no difference how you answer me. You got, you got to give an account to God. One day we're all going to give an account. I'd rather you do it now. I'd rather you take inventory now than to wait and have to do it standing before His throne in judgment one day. Can I ask you this? If if you would say, as I search my heart, I I, I just, you know, the Lord's maybe bringing things to my mind right now. Maybe maybe things I'm looking at on the internet. Maybe things I'm I'm Googling or I'm searching. Maybe stuff I'm partaking of. Maybe places I'm going. Maybe people I'm hanging out with. Maybe things I'm doing or things I'm saying. Maybe there's parts of my life that I know I am not guarding and preserving and protecting and defending my heart the way that I should. And I want to ask him today to forgive me. Man, God doesn't just put you out there on your own. He says, I will go with you. I will be with you. I will be an ever-present help in the time of trouble. He will give you the strength and the grace that you need. But if you'd say, that's me today. And I, 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 just, need to, I just need to be up front and real with the Lord. He already knows my heart. So I'm just going to admit it to him and ask him to forgive me and to help me. Guard, protect.